Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Career Breakthrough Series. I'm your host, Paul Ames, and if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review my show, or leave us an amazing comment to let us know what you think of the show by hitting the subscribe button on the bottom right or by hitting it up in iTunes. In today's episode, I get to interview somebody who's been such a big inspiration and motivator for my business and for my personal life. I'm talking about none other than Patrick Bet David. So Patrick's amazing story started with his family immigrating to America when he was only 10 years old. His parents fled Iran as refugees during the Iranian Revolution and were eventually granted U.S. citizenship. After finishing high school, Patrick decided to join the U.S. military and served in the 101st Division Airborne Division before starting his business career in the financial services industry. So Patrick worked for a couple of other agencies and traditional companies before he was inspired to launch his own amazing business called the PHP Agency. So the PHP Agency stands for People Helping People and is an insurance sales, marketing and distribution company, all of which he did before turning 30 years old. PHP is one of the fastest growing companies in the financial marketplace today. And Patrick is so passionate about shaping the next generation of leaders by teaching these people thought-provoking perspectives on entrepreneurship and disrupting the traditional approach to a career. Patrick's popularity has surged and created a buzz in the hearts of entrepreneurs all over the world, especially when he created the life of an entrepreneur in 90 seconds. This is the video that I was saying has created such a massive impact in such a short amount of time. So this short film he created accumulated over uh, 30 million views online and since it's been created into a book in June 2016, Patrick's newest book called Drop Out and Get School really gets people to challenge the concept of further education such as university and college. And Patrick shares some amazing insights and advice that goes against the traditional approach, which I really love, and how to adapt in today's society and career. So without further ado, let's get started on Patrick's interview. Guys, welcome to another episode of the Career Breakthrough Series. I'm your host, Paul Ames. On the show today, we've got such an inspiring guest, somebody whose video I've watched every single day within my business and really helps push me along. I'm talking about Patrick Bet David. So Patrick is the CEO of PHP Agency, is a successful author, and he's the creator of Valuetainment. So Patrick, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate your time to come on the show and share your journey. So if you could just give my audience a bit of a background into basically what your biggest career influences were for you growing up and basically what led you down to the path where you currently are in your career. So I, I was born, if I, by the way, first of all, thank you for having me. I was born and raised in Iran. I lived there uh, for 10 years. Uh, when Khomeini died, June 3rd, 89, I escaped uh, six weeks later. We went to Germany, lived at a refugee camp uh, for about a year and a half, two years. And from there, came to the States, um, lived uh, in Glendale, California for six years. Then I joined the U.S. Army, went into the military for a few years, had a great time at 101st Airborne Division, got out. Uh, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I was going to be the next uh, Middle Eastern Arnold Schwarzenegger. And so I awesome. started... Uh, um, you know, going to Mr. Olympia and all this other stuff with the aspirations of wanting to compete and uh, going to Hollywood. And then uh, all of a sudden I met a girl at Venice Beach. She approached me. We started dating and um, she was working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. And uh, I asked her, I said, how do you make your money? Because every time she would pick me up in a different car. And she said, I'm a, I'm a broker. And I said, that's great. What is a broker? She says, well, I'm a you know financial advisor. So I took my Series 7 with Morgan Stanley a day before 9-11, the major 9-11 attack that happened a day before is when I started with them. And then uh, after being with them for uh, some time, I left and I started working with Transamerica. I was with Transamerica for about seven and a half years and I left, started a PHP agency with 66 agents out of Northridge, California uh, in uh, 2009, October of now, which is eight years. And then now we have 4,500 insurance agents in 49 states. So uh, it's been a fun journey from then till now. You asked the question about what the biggest uh, events that inspired me to get to where I'm at today. Uh, Probably living in Iran and getting bombed on 167 times in a day uh, really shook me up. Uh, And and it told me if we can survive that, there's got to be something bigger to life. That's probably one. Uh, see my parents get a divorce and uh, my dad working at a 99 cent store um, and having heart attacks. He had 13 heart attacks. And my dad, my mother going back to Iran, 
um, because we ran out of money. That did a major number on me. And then going in the military and living by myself in the military and learning about discipline and all those things, that probably also influenced me tremendously. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. No, it definitely does, man. Thank you so much for sharing that, Patrick. And uh, I just wanted to touch on, I know I can't even imagine how difficult it would have been for you being over there, but um, I know you spent two years in a German uh, camp as well before you came to the US. So what do you feel like between that time coming from that German camp and, and then heading over to the US and starting a new life over, what were some of the biggest things that helped shape your life and helped make you the person that you are today from there? Probably what I learned at the German uh, refugee camp, I learned discrimination. And, and let me tell you how. So this doesn't sound like I'm pleading for being a victim and all this other stuff. I learned that, you know, no matter where you are, people are going to discriminate you, no matter what, what color you are. But it doesn't matter what you are, some more than less. But I, it made me learn how to make friends even with that. You know, because at the refugee camp, I had friends from uh, the Czech Republic. They were escaping a communistic regime. Friends from Albania, friends from Pakistan, friends from Afghanistan, friends from Iran, uh, friends from uh, Albania, friends from Yugoslavia. Never forget this family, Miodrag and Ana Maria. And, um, and, and we would sit there and we didn't know about each other. You know, they, they thought... I'm a Muslim from Iran. I wasn't a Muslim. I was a Christian. My mother's Armenian. My dad's a Syrian. There was so much about misconception that we judge in our minds prior to getting to know people. So, so that, that probably influenced me to want to get to know people a little bit more before assuming um, uh, what they're like and what their background's like. And that, that helped me a lot in, the, in, in, a, in, a, in life because when I went in the military, that was the second time around because in the military, I was the only Middle Eastern in the military uh, at Kentucky. And these people in Kentucky, they had never met anybody from Iran. So they're mm -hmm. thinking, you know, oh my gosh, this guy's a spy. So I would constantly tell them, I said, I am a spy. I'm here from Iran to take your system back to Iran. What do you think I'm here for? <laughs> <laughs> some of them would believe me and those who were naive enough to believe me I played along I gave them a hard time for them. I love but that I, I, you know, I learned those small little moments I learned about what it is to live in you know when they would explain to me about Mississippi and the culture in Mississippi versus North Dakota South Dakota people that grew up in New York versus people that grew up in Chicago the the, the thugs out of Miami versus the good people you know the the you know, normal people, because, you know, troublemakers join the military. You know, it's not a lot of times in U.S. it's like a savior. I had a one point at GPA in high school. I was a bad kid. So my savior was going to military. We all got along. We all figured it out. And, and, and it helped a lot by uh, learning how to deal with other personalities and other backgrounds. Definitely. Uh, thanks so much for sharing, Patrick. I completely agree. That's so true. Not being able to judge people and really getting to start to know people and, you know, the different personalities they've got. That's great advice. Obviously, you know, with my own background, with my career counseling business, that's a major thing to deal with people from all different uh, avenues and walks of life. So yeah, that's really relatable. Um, so, Patrick, obviously, we've all got our really uh, biggest strengths and traits that have helped us achieve success in the life that we've currently got. We've also got a really hindering habit or trait that we've got. So, what do you feel would be your most strongest uh, positive natural habit that you've got or your positive trait? And what would be on your flip side, the most hindering trait that you've got? Let me go with hindering because that's a long list. So, hindering, <laughs> uh, hindering would be a, 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 a heavy temper myself because I, uh, 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 um, you know, that's probably got me in trouble many, many times where I, I've lost it. I've had, there's some, you know, one day w when I die and the stories are written, there's going to be some epic private stories told about uh, me uh, getting extremely upset at uh, certain people or an individual or a group of people. And by the way, you know, I want to say 50% of them are probably going to be right because some of them are going to be, <laughs> but I'm going, to, I'm going to have to say they're probably right. Yeah. So that part, and I had to learn how to uh, uh, control my temper and realize that not everybody goes at the same pace. Uh, it's probably the best uh, way to assess that part on the fact that not everyone goes at the same pace. Uh, the, the other hindrance was, which kind of goes with the first one, 
is forcing people to succeed versus influencing people to succeed. It's something I have to learn in my 20s because, uh, I mean, I lost so many great friends and relationships because, uh, thank you, because to me, you know, I didn't understand how, how do you not want to win? Like, what is wrong with you? You, you must have problems to not want to work that hard and come to the office. So you, you know, and so I would, I would push people in a way. And I learned this mistake probably 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, took me till 27 uh, to learn this when I learned how to lead with choices instead of demands. It's a big difference when you yeah. lead with choices and it's a simple formula and adjustment to make. Um, so those are the hindrances. I can, I can go on a little bit more with that part. I'll tell you the, the strength, the strength is I really love people. Like I genuinely love people. I care for people. Like I can't help myself. Yesterday I'm on a flight back from LA and this couple sat next to me. First, the girl sat next to me. We're all trying to get this exit seat and she works for this company that comes and entertains employees and, you know, they do these different skits and spy and, you know, how do you handle this to add some fun and some educational purpose to it? He was working in marketing at Forest Lawn, which is the biggest cemetery in LA. And we knew that place. I knew a lot of stories about that cemetery. And I used to live a mile away from that place. And oh, wow. we started talking and, you know, they've been dating for three years. She's engaged. Uh, she wants him to get married. He doesn't want to yet get married. He had a kid from prior marriage. Uh, and, He's born, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, March 3rd, 1960. I'm just really fascinated by people. I literally am fascinated by people. And because I'm fascinated with people and I'm so curious with people, it probably gives me an edge to be able to influence because it's not coming from a place of, um, it's not coming from a place of how can I get you to do something so I win. Yep. I care without even having any incentives about you. Like, Definitely. you know, there's, I, I don't need to get paid for me to have to care about a human being. And uh, I'd say that's probably my, one of my biggest strengths. Yeah, definitely. And um, that definitely shines through, Patrick, in all of your content. Uh, I would check out all of your content all the time and the amount of value that you give and, you know, the, the honesty and authenticity that you share in that is, uh, yeah, is amazing. And, yeah, everyone, obviously, with the, the, the so many fans that you've got and uh, people that follow your content, it's because of that, definitely. I appreciate that. So, Patrick, um, I, I love your, your newest book that you've got out, Drop Out and Get Schooled. I absolutely love the content that's in that book. I mean, a lot of it I, I talk about in my career counseling with a lot of clients as well, especially people going to university or college as well, where basically you say that 70% of college students should drop out. I'd love you to touch on that a little bit more and just explain why you feel that 70% of college students should drop out because uh, I feel like it's something that I strongly agree with as well. Yeah, so uh, uh, for, first thing we need to identify is the fact that college is a business. I mean, that's just what we have to figure out. It's no longer a, a place uh, where an institution where you go for education used to be, not today. No. Think about it this way. From 1990 to today, I just want to give you this number. In 1990, an average four-year tuition in America was $33,000, Okay. Today, it's $93,000. Let me explain to you what this means. Here's what this means. This means that if I made the average income in America, you're in Australia, but the average income in America in 1990 was $53,000. So stay with me here. Yep. College went from 33 to 93. That's 3X, right? The average income in America was $53,000 in 1990. Today, it's $55,000. Whoa. Income has only gone up two thousand, but you have the so colleges have become businesses. It's Definitely. it's the easiest people to influence because you get a chance to start cre creating competition amongst kids at twelve, eleven years old nowadays on who's going to go to the better university, et cetera, et cetera. And then from there, if you steer that competition amongst kids, then you convince the parents that's the only way to success is to go out there and get a degree. You now have two people on the same team that one is going to push the other one out. The kid's going to say, Daddy, I need the money to go to college. 
or the parent's going to say, you better go to college or else you're not getting your, you know, trust or your will or such and such, right? Exactly. So regardless, we have gotten into that side of things where it's become a business and I'm just not a fan of it becoming a business. No. Um, and then the other part is the following. I don't know if right off the bat when I get out of high school, if I need to go to college right away. Yep. You know, sometimes you can go out there, you know, f- for me, if I'm hiring somebody, I am looking for discipline, focus, and life experiences, right? I want somebody to have a lot of hard work. Definitely. Uh, people that come out of college don't have a lot of that, no. you know? And so a kid doesn't go to college unless if they played sports, because if you played sports, you have discipline. Because if you don't train, you're off the team. If you're off the team, you lose the scholarship. That's so you have to make sure so you're disciplined to train, take care of your body, et cetera, et cetera, because you're being held accountable, which that's good. But going to college, you get a four-year degree. Who's holding you accountable? Nobody. You don't have to go to class. There is no you better or else. Um, you can ditch. You can go and miss half your classes and still get a C and still graduate, and no one will ever know because a bachelor's degree doesn't say, I got a bachelor's degree with straight A's or straight C's. It just says a bachelor's yeah. degree. I can't find out what, you know, how good you were in school. You know, even the worst kid gets a bachelor's degree in college. That doesn't tell me you have the right disciplines. No, uh, so a true. lot of kids nowadays are undecided. We've always been undecided about what we want to do. So what if a kid right after college, for me, a lot of the boys, especially in America, military would be a good option for those that don't have a uh, option on what they want to do. Why don't you go for a year? You know, let's create an 18 month program where, Boys go in the military and they learn a little bit about discipline and the way it could be is if your GPA falls under a certain number and, you know, you can go and serve the military. So from there, you'll learn discipline because who else is going to tell you after 18 years old, you better or else, you know, no one's going to tell you that you better or else. Um, so those will be some of my, uh, some of my things on where I'm at. And then the other thing is 80% of the subjects they teach, you are never going to use for the rest of your life. Literally, you are never, I would much rather send my kid to an institution that's going to teach them about how to truly communicate, not through let's read a book, this is the seven styles of communication and make sure you get the answers right. No, I would much rather send my kid to a school that's going to sit there and have a socialist debate a capitalist in front of the kids and I would bring the socialist and a communist and a capitalist and I would say, go at it for a full day. And I just want the kids to ask questions and they all debate. Let them make the decision on their opinion. I would much rather have a class school where a, I'm going to have three sets of people, one who uh, uh, wanted to stay single their entire life, one who got a divorce, one who's married with kids. And all of them who believe in the decision that they made purely debate why their decision is a better decision and let my kids learn. I would much rather have, you know, a, a group of six, seven, eight people that have different backgrounds come and debate why their career is the way to go. And the kid's going to sit there and say, wow, I just, I want to be a firefighter because I get, I want to join the military. You know what? That does make sense. I do want to kind of do that. Now I'm getting a better idea. I would much rather have those things. I would much rather have them... Uh, witness friction and how to handle friction and a legitimate friction and they're involved in the friction and they have to go through the friction. You know, I, I would much rather have somebody talk about how difficult marriage is and parenting is and the idea behind sex, not just the fact that you put a condom over a banana and now you know how to put a condom <laughs> on your penis and go get it. You know, no, I want the details behind of what it is that here's the consequences. Yeah. Here's what you got. I want. I want to go through all the drugs, educate me about all the drugs, you know, I want to know LSD, Special K, Ecstasy, Pot, Cocaine. I want all of those things. I want my kids to know all of those things because they're going to know it anyways, but I want them to be heavily educated in that and shown experiences in that versus chemistry and all this other stuff that you're just not going to be using. Exactly. So I don't, think, I don't think 80% of the topics are being taught are going to be used, and I think our educational system around the world needs a major, major reform. For sure. I couldn't agree with you more. And there's a few things I'd love to touch on that of what you just said. I think, yeah, the military, I think that's such a great option for a lot of, I mean, a lot of countries already instill this in all of their, as soon as you turn 18, you're into the military for 18 months. I think that's a brilliant idea. Like you said, especially to hold these people in the line, hold them accountable, like, because nothing else is going to do that. But also one big thing I've seen is obviously the biggest thing in the world is people listen so much to the influence of others, especially with their career decisions. I mean, the amount of clients I've worked with where you've had the parents influencing like exactly what you just said, Patrick, where they're going, you know, you need to go in this direction or you're going to be cut off or you're not going to you know, follow the footsteps of what we've done. Like, 
and they don't even understand the employment projection. Nobody, none of these people understand where employment's heading or you know, embracing technology the way forward. So yeah, some great points you really shared there. So Patrick, um, I've got a bit of a random question. I love to throw out all of my guests oh. on the show. Um, it's called the miracle question. It's a style of counseling that I've incorporated. So imagine if you went to sleep tonight and overnight a miracle had occurred. When you woke up the next day, anything you ever wanted or any impact you'd wanted to make on the world had come true. There were no financial roadblocks and no mental roadblocks holding you back. What would be that massive impact you'd love to make on the world and why would it be so important to you? Assyrians to have their own country back and Iran to become a democracy. Those would be probably two, two, two things for me because uh, just like Israel got their land back not too long ago, 50 years ago or so, uh, I want Assyrians to get their land back. Uh, it's not a lot of land, but it's a Nineveh. I would like them to get their land back. And so, you know, they, they have a very, very, the world is so much positively affected by the Assyrian community. But most people don't have a clue about the Assyrian, not Syrian, Assyrian community with an A in front of it. They were the first warriors. You know, they're the ones that came out with a lot of the calendars and all these other things that oh, wow. uh, they were major math community. Um, they, they, you know, they were the original mercantilism, which is capitalism and, you know, exchange system that they came out with where people were doing business amongst each other. So I, I would like the Syrian community to get their land back. And then Iran to become a democracy because, you know, there is so, so much rich history in Iran. I mean, it's... The history is so rich that the world's got to be able to go see it, learn it, study from it. And, and the people there, um, they produce some of the best mathematicians. They produce some of the best minds. Um, their, their level of expectation from parents to their kids are very high. Uh, I would like to see Iran become a democracy as well. But again, those are two things that you said miracles. Those would be the two at the top of my list. Definitely. That's perfect. I love that response, Patrick. And I think that's so, so good to see you thinking bigger than yourself. Like, I mean, a lot of people have come with that question and really a few people have thought about themselves, but it's good to see the majority of people thinking bigger than what they are, bigger than themselves and bigger than the impact they can make on the world. So that's, that's awesome, man. So Patrick, I know you've, uh, you're a big active reader and uh, huge into your self-development. And uh, I know you've read over 1200 books in the past 15 years. So just touching on that, I'd love to find out what's it must be a hard one to pick, but what would be your favorite book or the most impactful book that you feel has made such a big positive impact in your life or a detrimental change in your life? I, I mean, I have a top 100 list on my website that you can go find on patrickbaydavid.com. I got top 100 lists for books for entrepreneurs and movies for entrepreneurs, both. I have books and movies on my site. Laws of Success is number one on the list by Napoleon Hill. Not thinking, Grow Rich, Laws of Success. Uh, it's a bigger book, but it was a book that completely changed the way I viewed a lot of things in life. I love Laws of Success. Um, the other book that most people don't even care much about is Hypomanic Edge. Hypomanic Edge and First Rate Madness, it just kind of shows the direct correlation between madness and craziness and success. Oh, wow. Because uh, a lot of times people think just because they're, you know, people call them crazy or off or, you know, you're, you have ADD or you have ADHD or you have this and this and that. It puts them in a box of uh, um, mental disorders. You're in that world. You know, you're dealing with a lot of that uh, all the time with your career path that you've chosen. Uh, I think those, two, by the way, you yourself, you would really get a lot out of those two books. Yeah. But you asked me about what books made an impact. They're probably, those two books are probably not at the top of my list, but they did make an impact. So Perfect. going through it again, Laws of Success, number one. Okay. Hypomanic Edge and First Rate Madness would be a couple that definitely impacted my life. That's perfect. I'm definitely going to look into those ones myself. I'm really excited to, to venture into those. So, And that's funny you said about that, like um, especially with the hypomanic um, with the success. I remember when I interviewed Grant Cardone, he said the same thing. He said from a young age, they said he was ADHD, he needed these drugs, there was this wrong with him, this wrong with him. And it's because they don't understand people they don't understand you know traits about people they don't understand why people think a certain way and they just label you that way that like what goes back to what you were saying about you know understanding people for who they are not stereotyping people not 
before you understand and before you understand about their background and their history. So yeah, that's that's a great point you raised there. So Patrick, I'm just getting ready to wrap up soon, but what would be the best parting advice that you feel that you've heard that's really made a massive uh, impact in your life as well from everything you've gone through and uh, all the amazing journey and uh, powerful background you've had? I've had so much great advice, man. You're asking me what's the best advice I ever got. I guess uh, uh, it, what I'm about to tell you is the best advice I'm going to give based on all the advices that I got. You know, the whole thing about when people say the key to success is you got to marry the right person. The key to success is taking care of your body, respect, hard work, faith, relationships, love, all this. You, you hear all these things about the key to success, right? Um, I think to me, the key to success in life is learning how to process issues. It's that simple for me. Uh, and what I mean by process issues, I don't mean by solving problems. I mean by processing issues. Because sometimes uh, a problem may come up in a company and just boom, 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 we handle it, okay, next. Processing issues sometimes could be something you're dealing with in your own brain and your own mind that no one knows about. It could be a battle between a man who is raised in a family that marriage didn't work out and he doesn't want to commit because he's afraid that if he gets commits, it's not going to work out in his brain. And he has to process that issue to come up with a conclusion where it's not really an accurate belief that he has instilled in his mind or his parents have that he has to make an adjustment on. Learning how to process issues allows you to decipher between all the different religions and finding out what makes sense for you. And if it even does make any sense, so, you know, learning how to process issues uh, allows you to uh, decide which friends are true friends and which ones are just there for temporary. And it's still okay because you're getting a certain level of fun out of it as much as they are, but they're not going to be with you 10, 20, 30 years from now. You need to know that and understand that's okay. You know, it's just a season with these people you're friends with. Learning how to process issues uh, allows you to read people better based on trends that you talk and things they say and answers they give and stuff that they've experienced because you've learned how to process issues. I would say the number one skill set anybody has got to learn in life is learning how to process issues. That would be my uh, last advice I'd give to anybody. Wow, man. I, I love that. It's such a simple, simple idea, but it's so powerful. And that's probably the best response I've heard for the best advice. I mean, you know, how you laid it all out just makes so much sense. And if more people embrace that and took that on board, it makes such a big difference in the world and how everyone works through issues. So yeah, that's great. Uh, I've just got one last question before um, we get ready to wrap up, Patrick. So I absolutely love your life of an entrepreneur in 90 seconds video. As I said, I watch it every morning. It really fires me up and gets me charged up for the day. So what inspired you to create that? Obviously, I know you've gone through this journey yourself, but it's such a powerful video. And I'd love to know where you got your, your fuel and your inspiration for that video from. I, honestly, it's my life because, uh, um, you know, one day me, Paul, and Mario were sitting and... I just started saying, I said, you know what? We got to make a video that says the following. And I grabbed the phone and I literally started recording. Yep. And I said the entire script of Life of an Entrepreneur on my phone and we wrote it on. We made a video about it. Wow. You know, and, and it, was, it was so nonchalant. Like it wasn't like, oh my gosh, let's put so much time into it. But, but I wrote it based on what I've experienced in my life, you see, uh, there's a lot of kids that from beginning, you know, they're going to be successful. I wasn't that kid. Yeah. There's a lot of people that you meet that you say, well, this guy comes from a family. He went to school. His dad was a banker and, you know, his dad used to make 150 grand a year. And this guy went to college, played sports. He played football. He played baseball. He's, he's a winner. I mean, everything about him looks like a winner. Yeah, I wasn't that guy. I, I didn't play sports. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't play organized sports. I didn't have good grades. I didn't come from a family that had ever made any money. Um, I didn't come from a pedigree of, hey, go read books. My dad dropped out of school at eighth grade. Uh, no one ever told me growing up, not, not my mom, not my dad, you go read books. I've never been told that. So I didn't grow up in a family where I would catch my dad sitting there reading books. I picked up the habit or my mom would want to read books and I picked up the habit. I grew up in a family where we would watch Jerry Springer. If you remember Jerry Springer, yeah, I don't know. Sure, if do. Definitely do. We watched the dumbest shows that just are purely entertainment. Nothing was like 
Let's watch National Geographic on why giraffes' necks are set up this, this way. <laughs> no, we, we were an entertaining type of family with a lot of friction. And so when, when I decided, and my dad had a heart attack, and I decided in that one parking lot outside of UCLA Medical Center that I wanted to go out there and win big, and overnight, literally overnight, my eyes changed. People wouldn't recognize my eyes. They thought I was ticked off, but I was determined. I was going to win for this guy. And all the sacrifices he made to bring us to America, I, I was going to go out there and win for them. Uh, there's nothing that was going to get in my way. And nothing in my resume said that I was supposed to win. Nothing. Yeah. And so that story is a story of uh, anybody that decides to go out there and win big to know that it is very normal to go through hell and back. It is very normal to be lonely at times. It is very normal to have your closest friends criticize you. It is very normal to have to go through the pain that you have to go through. But uh, it is a million times better feeling than you think it is Definitely. once you go out there and win big. I can't even describe that high when it does happen. Yeah, I can, I, I can, I think that's why I relate to your video so much as well from what you've just shared is I feel exactly the same way. You know, I was kind of given up on through school and most of my time always told I wasn't smart. I was dumb. I was an idiot. You know, my parents came from working class background. My grandma, my dad, my dad, my dad, my dad had his own cleaning business. We never had much money. Um, went through high school, just jo uh, left high school, job hopped till I was 30. And then something, a, a drive ignited in me, something ignited in me. And when I hit 30, I just went, you know what, I need to change this. And just having a look back with my career counseling business, giving back to, you know, the biggest pain point I saw through high school is what drives me. So, Good for yeah. you, man. Keep it going. Love it. Love the story. Awesome. Well, um, Patrick, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. You're, you're, you should be so proud of yourself. You're such an inspiration. And uh, yeah, it's, it's so good to, to hear your journey and your story and, and have the pleasure of being able to interview you. So thank you so much for your time, man. You're an absolute pleasure. I appreciate pleasure. that. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And Patrick, just before we go, where would be the best place? Say if anyone wanted to get on board with your incredible content, where would be the best place to reach out to you? I, look, you, uh, I respond back to Instagram private messages and Snap. I just may take a while because I get thousands of messages, but I still respond back on Instagram and, and Snap. Patrick Bed David, my Snap is Bed David 19. But the best place to find me is on YouTube. If you want to go through my content, there's 600 plus videos on YouTube. Just type in Patrick Bed David and you'll see it all over the place. And if you don't know how to spell my last name, just type in the word entrepreneur and you'll find me on there with a bunch of videos. Awesome. And uh, guys, be sure to jump on board with Patrick's incredible books as well. They're, they're absolutely life-changing. And I'll definitely put the links to all them in the show notes. Patrick, thank you so much, man. I'm, I absolutely love your content. Keep up the great work, man. You're, you're an incredible person. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. And guys, stay tuned next week. We've got another incredible guest who's really going to help you break through that glass ceiling in your career. So stay tuned then.